Hi, John LaRue here from the Beerbrook Art Gallery. And when I was studying architecture back in the early 1990s, my parents decided to get me a subscription to a magazine called Arts Atlantic, which covered the visual arts in New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, PEI, and Newfoundland. And it was great because in architecture, of course, it's an art form and it fused with the visual arts in so many ways. And I was getting really interested in the visual arts scene, certainly in New Brunswick. And the very first magazine I got in that subscription in spring of 1992 was this one. And on the cover was one of the most impressive artworks I think I had ever seen at that time. It's called Face by Philip Iverson. And it's actually taller than me. It's about eight feet tall. And I was enamored and amazed by it when I first got it because not only was it one of the most heroic magazine covers I'd ever seen, I couldn't believe that something like this had ever been painted, certainly by someone in Fredericton, New Brunswick. And at the time, Philip was one of the most innovative and exciting artists, certainly in Eastern Canada. And we lost him far too soon in 2006. But luckily, this work, Face, is now in the collection of the Beaverbrook Art Gallery. And it's one of the most enthralling pieces that we have. It's inspiring, not only because it fuses so many different types of art movements. It's got cubism in it, surrealism, expressionism. And that's the beauty of Philip Iverson. But it was, it was literally made with junk and detritus that most people would have thrown away. And a guy like Philip would take these, put them together, and make the work of the, of the utmost beauty that you could ever imagine. And it's fascinating to kids that are four years old and people that are 94 years old and everyone in between. And I just want to read you a section from the article on this that the late Alan Bentley wrote um, and where he speaks about face. And this is uh, Alan's really erudite way of talking about this, but he says, in face, the central human figure intrudes remorselessly into space, asserts its presence, and then collapses back upon itself in a kind of metaphorical black hole. It implicitly carries in its wake, sucking in, as it were, space, time, and the viewer's sensibility, along with the junk and discarded matter of the world. I'd just like to put William Blake, Alan Bentley could see more in the grain of sand than anyone I knew could. So on a high level, that's part of what face is, but let's look at it on a more visceral, close level. Philip developed a unique style all his own when he was a student at Mount Allison University in the early 80s studying fine arts. And you do these enormous gestural heads with really strong lines, uh, very emotional, very, uh, very strong, very fervent. And they looked pre-planned, but they weren't at all. In fact, they were completely improvised. Uh, and what he would do is start literally flinging paint at a canvas while he was sort of almost doing this dance while loud music and opera was playing. And after a few minutes of this or even an hour, uh, these pieces would appear and he would see whether it was an eye or an arm or a nose and he would build on it. And sometimes he could be really realistic, like in this self-portrait from 1991, but a lot of other times uh, it, was, it was very raw and very very emotive and he would also find uh, used thrown out pieces of plywood and build these almost these dimensional constructions to paint on like still baton and dead tree here from 1991 done the same year as face and you can see the similarities unlike the raw plywood edges of the last piece philip could be really sensitive and gentle when he wanted to be but still have that that edge to it as well like you see in this work from 96 called eva look at those eyes and the nose and the lips you're just drawn into this introspection this inner light from from the figure and philip had a skill and like almost any painter in the region he could really really paint and here the flatness i think he defers to to the quality he wanted to get through the model he was also very well known for a piece that he did at the Beaverbrook in 1996 called Boat, which took up the entire perimeter of the McCain Wing now, where the whole Atlanta Gallery is. And it's one of the biggest paintings in the history of New Brunswick. And that painting uh, was actually given to Leo Hayes High School uh, just about 10 years ago, and it now hangs permanently in their cathedorium above. And it's one of the largest public artworks, probably in a high school in Canada. And uh, it's, it's used for different classes, with even English classes and art classes all the time. It's, it's an amazing work, and it's great that it can be seen every day.
By the early 2000s, Philip's style changed again, where he became almost like an early Jackson Pollock from the 1940s, where he would have a series of, of brightly colorful symbols, almost in this erratic pattern, but, but this real joyous, powerful composition, where he'd have eyes and symbols and lightning bolts and elements. He also did some really much more detailed uh, figures of famous painters as well, faces like Francisco Clemente and Alex Katz in the early 2000s. So he never lost that sense of portraiture. And again, just his skill was paramount. You could really say that Philip Iverson's face is half painting and half sculpture, so it has a lineage to some famous 20th century sculptural works, like Nam Gabo's Constructed Head of 1915, which is really an assemblage of just pure two-dimensional planes to make a convincing three-dimensional object, which really holds its own in open space. Uh, it also really brings to mind some cubist works like Pablo Picasso's 1909 Head of a Woman, which has this dynamism and movement, almost as if it's, it's sort of shimmering in space. You can see it from different angles. So Iverson would have been greatly inspired by some of Picasso's later flat works as well, like The Weeping Woman from 37, where it almost seems dimensional because with his delineated areas of color, it's almost jutting out energetically from the surface of the painting. And that energy of color and, and almost chaotic adjacencies of pinks and greens and so on uh, came out of his uh, fascination with the, the German Expressionist movement after World War I. So Iverson, as I mentioned, was, was very conscious of assembling pieces together, sometimes found in junkyards, sometimes bought. And you can look at some French work by the sculptor Jean Tingali from the 1960s, where you get something that literally looks like a junkyard of things cast together, but that work informally, there's balance, there's excitement, and it feels alive. Just like Frank Gehry's architecture does as well in the 80s. It seems like it should be falling apart, but it's held together by, by this dynamic sense of, of, uh, of linearity and fluidity and movement. Uh, it's, an, it's an incredible lineage that Philip is part of. And the funniest thing about this is when you look at the work, how many media do you think are in this sculpture? Normally there's two to three. Some kids may think maybe there's 10 in Philip Iverson's. There are actually, believe it or not, ready for it? 24 different kinds of objects and media in this. Most people, they would never guess that many. They could have a hard time guessing half as many. But just to give you a little quiz to see how good you are, uh, take a guess of this from Tate LaRue. Hi, I'm Tate, and we're gonna play a game. Which of these four objects is not a material used in Philip Iverson's huge sculpture called Face? Is it A, a plastic paint tray, B, a deck of playing cards, C, a beer bottle, or D, an old plastic broom. The answer is playing cards. So it almost seems comical in what's in this sculpture, but that's the magic of Philip Iverson, what he could combine, things that you normally wouldn't give a damn about, make magic in his work. So it contains plywood, lumber, wood, metal mesh, drywall screws, beer bottle, plastic paint tray, chicken wire, metal staples, styrofoam, vinyl flooring, rope, paint cans, paint can cover, broom, canvas, tar sealant, nails, coat hanger, hubcap, sandpaper, angle brackets, glue, and paint. Yeah, there you have it. So let's get closer to face. We'll see where all these materials are. Some are pretty obvious and some will surprise you how hidden they are, but they're there. Here's the hubcap in the right eye from an old Volkswagen. And below that there's paint dabs on canvas above the cheekbone. Uh, above the forehead is lath with paint dabs and screws holding it together. There's in the left eye the paint can with some vinyl above giving these interesting eye effects. Above that is the beer bottle and the paint tray, uh, surrounded by chicken wire uh, and gauze, making that sort of this dimensional piece. And behind that is the broom. Not sure why the broom's there, but it's there. And there's the paint can on the chin uh, with a bunch of rope dangling out of it and staples above the nose, creating an interesting metal effect. And there's tar above the ear, some colored background behind, a bunch of nails kind of encrusted in wax uh, in the upper neck. And there's the cheek uh, and the chin and lips kind of coming up prior of a ship, all with this window implied behind, giving the whole sculpture depth. There's this detritus and found wood, probably it was at the bottom of the studio one time, and signed, Auberson 91 in the bottom corner. 
Uh, there's some dimensionality from the side. You can see the eye and the face, like the Gabo sculpture, and then this wonderful nose as well. So I hope you can see why it was worthy that Philip Iverson's face made the cover of Arts Atlantic in the early 90s. It was, it was so much, it really was at the cusp of the avant-garde in sculpture and in painting in Atlantic Canada in the early 90s. No one was doing work like it. 30 years later, it continues to inspire. At last year's fashion show at New Brunswick College of Craft and Design, it was actually the inspiration for their first year fashion challenge where all of the first year students had to do a work inspired by the color, shapes, and forms of Iverson's face. Here's the winning design. You can see with its, its really exuberant uh, top upper sort of vest jacket with the, the strips of color, uh, different materials, and then even the hat and the makeup. And the winner, we thought we saw so much of it, uh, and it was still so timely, we actually displayed it next to the final Iverson face in the Atlantic Gallery for a couple weeks last year. And it just goes to show that however old the work is, if it was done with intent and heart and energy, it can be as contemporary as ever. And Philip Iverson's works from 1991, but it's still invigorating and inspiring, and we can't wait to share it with you when we open up again. So thanks very much, and look forward to the next time.